Okay. Today's uh, June 13th, Monday, 2005. We're doing an interview in Coton on the Hudson, New York, on 55 Baton Road. Can you tell tell me your full name and your date of birth? My name is Margaret Cooper Opie. Mm -hmm. My full birth is September 29, 1935. And you were born here in New York? I was born at Austin, New York, the old Austin Hospital, which is now Star Bethlehem. Okay. Uh, can you tell me from your childhood, who was the best cook in your family, or the best cook you knew? My Aunt Mag. And, and My Aunt Mag was a cook who worked for a very rich family on Spring Valley Road. Mm -hmm. And they, I believe were connected with a coffee company. But everybody knew Mag was a wonderful cook, and I learned from Aunt Mag. And where was she from? Aunt Mag was from Windsor, North Carolina. Okay. you have any idea? My when... mother, oldest sister. Do you have any idea when she came to uh, Austin? About? I believe... I believe Aunt Mag came after my mother came, and my mother came in the 19th, maybe 1930 mm -hmm. or so. So my Aunt Mag was somewhere between 1930 and 1935. What made her a good cook? What made Aunt Mag a good cook? The taste. It was her way of, uh, her flavor, and also she had flavor. She she made you know that she loved what she was doing. Did you ever see her cooking? No idea, any idea what she what she has? She seasoned the food. You know what kind of season she used? The actual names of the spices and herbs and vegetables. Well, for example, uh, Aunt Mag had two ways of cooking. Also, because when she cooked for the family she worked for, I don't think she used the same as she did. Uh, all of the same way that she did with for a family. She had five children, mm -hmm. and this was my mother's oldest sister, and she uh, supported these children by herself because her husband was still in North Carolina. They had separated. And uh, Aunt Mag had to feed. There were four boys and one girl. So the way she cooked for them was more, I believe, uh, for abundance. Mm -hmm and flavor, and then remember limited budget. In contrast, when she worked for the family, <clears throat> they lived on Spring Valley Road, and they were wealthy people, so anything she needed, uh, it was available to her. For example, she, you know. I mean, when, when, you, when she cooked for her family, what, for instance, what were some of the typical meals she would make for her children? Oh, I remember she'd make chicken and dumplings and... She'd make uh, pots of cabbage, and they were seasoned with ham hocks. And uh, I always had to have a glass of water because she'd put the uh, red peppers in there. And they were hot and seasoned. And uh, she made wonderful biscuits. And she'd also make what we call spoon bread, which was uh, flour bread in a big black skillet. And we would have that, top that with molasses. And she made home fries. When she made home fries, she probably do almost five pounds of potatoes. She could get in the deep. Uh... In those black skillets, she fry. And and back in them days, they cooked with lard. In contrast, when she worked for those the the other family, she cooked with Crisco. Okay. See, so poor people didn't use the same things as the wealthy people. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea? So. Well, she was she was hit up here. You knew her mostly after the depression. Then. It doesn't sound like you knew her during. The depression. I was born in depression, but so. But I'm saying with her, do you remember how? Did, I mean, how did she survive during the depression? Where she had a good enough job that she always had money. Well, when she came up, well, I don't know how much money you can call it, but she came, she came up here. To my knowledge, I can only go by what my mother said, and. Uh, First of all, my mother had two sisters. 
My aunt Bertha worked for a wealthy family in Austin. My mother was the up, upstairs maid, and my my aunt Bertha was downstairs. And then my aunt, they all did domestic work. Mm-hmm. And one of the things you would find that a lot of the women, especially black women, that's what they the jobs that were available to them was domestic. Sometimes, like uh, with your grandmother, she did laundry. Mm-hmm. But it was always a way in which they took the skill they had and they marketed it. But you don't remember there being a scarcity of food necessarily in your Aunt Maggie's house or your own house growing up during the Depression or how they act? What well, you know, different? I'm going to tell you, one of the things that I do remember, there was scarcity of money, mm-hmm. but they learned how to make do with a little. I also remember when my mother... We used to have to go up to the welfare office to get a bag of flour, and and uh, I think they gave them lard and, and flour. And so uh, I don't know what else they got with it. It's, it's funny because the person that I interviewed uh, right before this, Miss Monroe, mm-hmm. she recalls that during the Depression her father got, uh, you know, they, they did pretty well. Mm-hmm. But things got tight during the Depression, so they right. decided to go uptown and the he said that the town, probably the the, the, the village, the, the village. It's not a good time right now, if you don't mind. Okay, is there a time that would be better for me to come back tonight? No. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But um, what 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 would happen? She said it was the village of Austin would be probably in charge of whatever federal aid. Right. Exactly. Happen. Yeah. And they would go up and she said her father went up one time to get food, and came back and overheard a mother and father said, we can't give this to the children because this is not the dog food. Right. It was meat, but it was dog mm-hmm, food. Mm-hmm. But you're saying that there were other things available that were handed out. So you don't remember any Well, see, uh, the thing is, Ethel was older than me. By the time I came to, remember, she's 86 years old. I'm, I'm 70. Ten years difference probably made a difference. But she's talking about during the Depression, during the 30s. That's what I'm saying. talking about towards the end of the beginning. Well, yeah, sure. but see, what I'm saying is her experience, again, it's just like Cousin Katie's experience would be different than mine. But she, so, you don't, so you don't remember, though, during the Depression? I mean, you remember there were things available, like flour, lard. Anything else that you remember your family getting from uh, food aid? I don't know. See, one of the things also, I remember my Aunt Mag at one time when she moved from one house to another. She lived over Nick's Market, mm-hmm. or this I remember, on North Highland Avenue. Mm-hmm. And Nick would give away the soup bones. Like, she could go down there. In other words, what you would call waste mm-hmm. or scraps, she could make a soup out of that. Okay. So there was never anything, and, and that's one of the things I also remember about black people, even with soul food. What the people threw off, black people could make do and made flavor. She got it for free from him. She didn't. Have to I don't know where she got it free, but she probably got it at cost. Uh-huh. And she might have, see that part. I can't do because you must remember when when all the people were doing, you didn't always know how they did it. Uh-huh. But I do remember visiting, and I remember Nick's Market, uh-huh. and uh, often she had them soup bones, and she would take those soup bones and make uh, lima beans, you know, all like, and so like. There wasn't all this question about you don't eat pork. You ate what you could get. Mm-hmm. What I what I remember the most about them is, like I say, my thing, and it's funny because today I was at a funeral where, again, it was black cooking. And uh, there were some women there who came up from Brooklyn. They were busy talking about what you don't eat, and they were in the hell. And all those cooks in the kitchen, everything was from scratch, was and so one girl who was basically, I guess, a vegetarian or whatnot, said, I'm going off my diet today. And it, it was just the flavor. They had mustard greens. They had, instead of fried chicken, they had baked chicken. They had homemade banana pudding, all those kind of things. So you see, again, these people learn how to make do with what they had. They had uh, homemade uh, cornbread. They had homemade rolls. But all that's... The, the key when we grew up was homemade versus store bought. Mm-hmm. Um, now, from from your memory or whatever you can remember, from mm-hmm. 
Well, I mean, for example, research I've done mm-hmm. on African American foodways is all the way up into the 1950s. Right. Nobody even uses the term soul food. Does, I mean, does it, it doesn't exist no. anywhere in the literature. It but wasn't. Then when you get to the late 1960s and 70s, the term soul food is being... You know where soul food came from, as far as the term? Well, I mean, I, I guess my question is, first yeah, of all, go ahead. You, what do you remember about the Black Power Movement in this area here in Westchester County and Austin, and any relationship between Black Power, any activists that would talk about uh, Blacks, and then, you know, certainly music was celebrated, natural hair was celebrated, mm-hmm. African clothing was celebrated. Angela do you, Davis. Do you remember at all food br- being brought into that discussion? Uh... I remember when there were some guys who came in who were supposed to be, uh, which is why I told you you need to talk to the guy who was involved. Um, what they call them? The Panthers? Yeah, Black Panthers. It was at that point, in contrast to, you ever hear of Daddy Grace? Yeah. Anybody tell you about that? All right. Well, back then when Daddy Grace was, again, he was in depression, and he said, and they said, well, in contrast, when this movement came, uh, the, the difference between Daddy Grace's appeal to community and the uh, Panthers. Panthers was, they started with what is called the breakfast program. Mm-hmm. Okay. The other thing is, I remember when I worked in Austin in uh, what they call OEO, which is uh, Government Opportunity Economics. Uh, I forgot what the whole thing is now. My my brain isn't doing too well. But anyhow, the point being is when federal government people started coming in, they started talking about trying to gear people towards healthy eating. Uh, because, through the program you're talking about? Yeah, through the program. What was it, called? it was called uh, OEO, Opportunity Economic Something. The old part, I can't think. Maybe I'll find it. Yeah. But in, it, for some reason, you remember them trying to make. The well, they were trying. In a sense, no. I'll tell you what happened. When they were giving out through welfare and whatnot, uh, food. Like, and I'm gonna tell you where it came from. Excessive flowers and you know and all and and the peanut butter and all that. What they found out is, the people weren't using it. Mm-hmm. And that was. Uh, so they they realized, and through meetings and whatnot, that if you're going to give poor people this stuff, you got to teach them how to use it. Mm-hmm. And it was because it was different than what they were accustomed to. So, for example, when you make a peanut butter cookie, a lot of people don't like peanut butter cookies. So this peanut butter was going to waste, and they had to find out. So they'd bring in, they'd even suggest maybe some nutrition, and we had meetings with welfare mothers, about what you do with this, you know, um, and it was not well, cooking or yeah. government, yeah, exactly, cheese, the kind of stuff where your doctor tells you, you know, even me, I can't have cheese because it's too much yeah, high in cholesterol. Remember the doctor say, saying don't eat certain things? Do you all remember that? No, they didn't tell us that then. That's what I'm saying. And the thing is, the government was issuing things that were not good for people. Okay. Was there a response from black activists against this food, or they well, black activists? I don't think so much were because it wasn't into health food. It was the swine. They were against pork. Okay. That's I remember when that swung, and all of a sudden they're gonna come in the community and say you shouldn't eat that swine, and people raised on swine, so it was hard to persuade them. It's when uh, Malcolm X and um, uh, that whole movement came, you know, black nationalists and Muslims, trying to take that into where people are accustomed to it. That was hard. It's hard to persuade them. And community response was silence or act like they didn't hear or? Some of them thought it was foolishness. So they just kind of laugh at them? Yeah, yeah, you've got to be kidding. I mean, it, just, it was almost like today my experience where this girl said, I'm not supposed, they all listening what they're supposed, not supposed to eat. But she only needs mustard green, and, and, and they go over and ask the lady. She said, there's some pork in there. Well, I know I'm not supposed to have pork, but today is an exception. 
but would you have heard you're saying in the 60s and 70s when particularly in the 60s with Malcolm X and other actors? Yeah, they started with the anti-swan. That was the thing. But people would people would say, I know I'm not supposed to, or they would just say, I'm eating it. This is what I eat. Well, you had two groups. You had the group who said, I'm eating this because it's what I raised on. And I, and then you had, you see, you know, another thing happened with uh, the black Muslim movement, including Malcolm. Those guys came out of jail. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were, were uh, inmates. Now, they could easily say, I refuse to eat certain things because they were more selective. But when you get out here and you got to buy, and you can get yourself a ham hock cheaper than you can get a steak. You see, this was even before. They weren't vegetarians at that point. Vegetarian thing came later as far as black consciousness. When did you see vegetarianism kind of come into black? It also, uh, in my opinion, the vegetarian movement, and I see it even now, I think it's more with advanced education. You, it's kids who went off to college, just like yourself. Many of them would come back home and say, I don't eat, I don't eat swine, I don't eat this, I don't eat this, that. They went, they went off with one diet, came back with another. And, and, and one of the, like the I see it days. even now. I mean, but when did you first start seeing it, historically speaking? When do you remember? I was conscious of it probably in the 80s and 90s. I began to see this pendulum swing. And even now. But I mean, keep historically because. Yeah. It's, it's, Contemporary okay. stuff, not that much interested in it, but more winded. Well, for example, even health food sto stores in Harlem, when I was working in Harlem, I was working in Harlem in the 70s. Mm -hmm. There was maybe, uh, I'll tell you who I knew. The guy who owned a uh, black bookstore, mm -hmm. who took over behind the man, oh, I can't think of his name. He's one you should know, too. Uh, I see him even now. I'll tell you when you would see him. If you go to the Black History uh, Festival at the end of this month, he was more than likely to be there with, his That's with the dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. That whole group of dreadlocks, first of all, it came from, a lot of them were um, Jamaican. Jamaicans. Caribbean. They, yeah, Caribbean. They were more conscious of vegetarian diet. And you would hear it on WLIB. You know, you, I mean, if you listen to what I consider progressive thinking, and uh, you stop into these, uh, for myself, I'd go to certain bookstores and whatnot. That's where you hear vegetarian discussion. Then you begin to, uh, like even the girl today. And that was the 70s when you were 13? This is in the 70s when you begin to hear them. And they, they were trying to persuade, I mean, you know, don't eat that stuff, that stuff's not good for you. Eat that swine, sister, you know, and whatnot. But it was hard. So what the early ones were who began to adopt it, became Muslim, even the women. You see, the other thing is a child often is nurtured on a mother's diet. So to get that child or, or introducing a child to the diet is through the parents. So if the father was Muslim and the mother is Muslim, then likely, okay? Mm -hmm. The other thing, like I say, my observation was uh, Kids like going to Columbia and whatnot. You see, you almost knew where they were. Uh, they they go up to New England. They're in. They they really were in uh, so-called progressive environments. Do you think? Uh, I mean, the '70s was really the height of Bob Marley and his influence. That was the whole there. thing. So you think there was a relationship between his popularity and, and you know the Rastafarian? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It was no question that that introduction. Because, you see, just like, I'm trying to think of that, but this brother used to have a radio station on WLIB. He would talk about this. Even now, I listen to a Jamaican station late at night, and this Gary, brother still talks. No, no, Gary was also vegetarian. I know who you're talking not about. Gary, no, but the black no, man. Gary, I can't think of. But he's not the one I'm talking about. I listen to him also. If you remember the other person's name, that would be important. Yeah. This guy, I'll, I'll try to write it down next time. He had a store in the Bronx. He still has one there? Yeah, and he broadcasts on. I listen to him. And that brother is... He's an older older guy? He's a Rastafarian, I think. But he's been, on, he's been on the radio talking like that since the 70s? No, I don't know when he started, but I'm talking about... I'm just taking you from the cycle. But Gary Bird, that's who... Gary Bird. Yeah. But Gary Bird would talk about it. 
this brother that I'm telling you, Kanye, I think that's his name. Uh, he had the bookstore, uh, the tree, the tree something. He he would push that when you went in there. He he'd be telling you about his book. He'd be talking about his diet. Uh, store in the Bronx. I don't know whether Kanye has it, but this other, this old, older man. Okay. They're two different people I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll tell you somebody that I would say that you might want to talk to. Hester Spencer's daughter, who I was with today, uh, Beverly Spencer, lives in Brockwood. She she uh, was really trying to put, even today, she talks about the herbs and, and, and you know, what to take on. She would be, even though she's younger, you would. she went to Africa and then came back and changed her whole thing. She works in the Bronx, and she was talking today about the difference, the terrible way these diets. But my observation is that the vegetarian diet and the way, the, the difference in eating came from, I believe, an academic explosion. And in contrast, the Jamaicans and the Rastafarians, I see a connection there. Okay. Uh, but, and, and that really didn't have much of an influence up here in Westchester. It was more if you were down. It was mostly in the city, yeah. It was more in the city. But in Westchester then, what you would see is those who had gone off somewhere. Now, for example, she went to Yale, mm-hmm. okay? So that's what I'm saying. The environment that the persons were in, I think, influenced the way they, what they did, what they accepted, how they ate, as far as change. I think that made a major difference. I think you will find that as you talk to the different age groups. Um, when you, when Go ahead. You, uh, I mean, in the sense, I've talked to three people, maybe four people up in Washington. Canada, right. Who basically said that. I said, tell me about the Black Power Movement. Because they don't even know about they it. They basically said there was nothing to tell you. They didn't have no influence on it. They were here. People what say, age were they? These are, you know. Older people? Yeah, I mean, well, let me yeah, let me l- let me give you why, in my opinion. No, but I mean not necessarily what what they thought, but I, I would actually rather hear your opinion on what influence, if any, did you did you see with the Black Power Movement in this area? Well, for example, when I worked at the, uh, we I moved from one program to uh, core came here, but those guys came from Chicago. You see, there, there was a there was a. There was a core chapter. chapter they tried to push here, but in in, in Dub- yeah, in Austin. Yeah, see, when you talk to Walter, he could tell you all of it. Remember the names of the people that they came from for? Walter could tell you. Okay. I remember those guys, but what I'm trying to tell you, those guys, when they came into the community, they were basically, we were accepting the Walter and some of them. You know, Walter almost ran his movement out of the barber shop. Uh-huh. See, now talking to some of those people. But Walter is still on his thing, so. Tell me about the core people when they But came the in. core people, what I'm trying to tell you, they were basically rejected. 1970s? Yes. Right, well. And the reason they were rejected, everybody knew, and probably they found out. See, in a small town like Austin, people know who the detectives are. And they're so called supposed to be undercover. They were not trusted because one of the questions was whether they worked for the government under the disguise. So people didn't trust. And one thing you find in small towns, when an outsider comes in, he has a hard time breaking through. Because people are suspicious of anybody. It's but, a, but you associate core with black power type of movement. They, well, not as much now, because one of the things I... But I'm saying back then. Back then, I did. But what I found is, for example, the guy who was still the son of the man who uh, was very active in New York, the core, he, to me... As conservative as he is, I mean back then. So they came in, they tried to create a chapter and some organization. But in double got off the ground. Well, you'd have to talk to Walter. He may say they got off the ground. In my opinion, they they weren't they weren't able to be effective. But I can say one thing: whenever there were demonstrations or anything of that sort, matter of fact, I'll give you a, a successful. I knew a guy named Ernie. I can't think of Ernie's name. He came to Austin, and there were no black engineers uh, working at um, the wire mill in Austin. I know that. Ernie was the first. He was involved with CORE. Mm-hmm. 
So it was that kind of thing, breaking through. Okay. How many? You know how many people came before? Was it a group of four? Four organizers? Three organizers? No. Um, the guys that I knew again, I, I, I only knew about three guys. Ernie, I knew. Uh, this other guy. Is he still alive? I think Ernie died. I, his last name? I can't think of but like I said, if you talk to Walter he's he's a wealth of uh reference. So I mean so, so when you're asking me about what when you're talking about movements or what I'm trying to give you a connection, a lot of the older people were afraid to get involved. Therefore, persons like myself and whatnot who were activists, it was two categories. Chris Boswell I spoke to today, he's a good person for you to definitely talk to. Not only for that, but also to give you some movement history. He may even remember, and I'm trying to think whether Jerry Richardson was involved with CORE. I know Jerry became a president in NAACP, but I don't know. Because he also moved here from Pittsburgh. And one thing that they all said, those who came in, the often was difficult to break in. Mm -hmm. In other words, they always, uh, it's almost like quoting or asking, for example, I've been quoting here now over 30 some years. They'll tell you you're new. If you talk to an old timer, they'll call you new. Okay? Well, I think was the kind of thing that when somebody came in, if they were an activist, it's like you got to work your way in. You know what I mean? They did not accept that somebody come out. I'm coming to, you know. Let me ask you yeah, go ahead. another question before we stop. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Bar Harbor and, <laughs> and, and Club Six and the Wonder Bar. I mean, were they... You were mean diet-wise? Were they soul food restaurants or what, what kind of restaurants? Well, I'll tell you what they were. First of all, just like you said, all three of them were bars, but they supplied food. Mm -hmm. So usually any... Most black black bars had to have food. Uh, the place where I told you about that uh, Chris Boswell worked at Weeks's, that was a bar, but they were known for the best fried chicken, and Chris used to cook there. Uh -huh. So like I said, wherever there was alcohol served, that type of bar, they always had a food place because when those people, especially late at night, when they start drinking, then they get hungry. So usually there was a separate person had that concession. Okay. In the bar. Okay. But another thing, because of segregation, black people would go, I'm talking about young people like us, you would go to these bars sometimes not so much for drinking, but to get a good food. Are you talking the 50s? Yeah, I'm talking 50s now. Okay. okay? So you weren't, and you weren't necessarily going there for the music. You were going there to get well, sometime, well, sometimes they had live music on Sunday night. Mm -hmm. But not every day. But a lot of times, I mean, it was a combination. If, if for example, with Bar Harbor, on Sunday night they'd have entertainment. Located, by the way? Right on Hunter Street. It's right pulled right, down now. It was right across the street from Grandma's house? No, no. Not at all. That was, Mr. that, that, what you think about from Grandma's house, was a grocery store. Okay. First it was owned by a tag, Mr. Mr. Brianna. Uh -huh. Matter of fact, his uh, grandson is a... Uh, Great grandson is a lawyer. Okay. I could tell you about that connection too. Cause then, next then next to them was Mr. Willie. Mr. Willie took that over after Mr. Brianna gave up. But down the street, down the on the left hand side, not, not far as the prison, where where Bar Harbor was, I'd have to show you, uh, all right. because it's no longer there. It's next to where the Habitat for Humanity, this space that was that okay. is torn down. But that was Bar Harbor. Okay. Uh, there also was a little place not too far from the left of my mother, few daughter, used to be called the Busy Bee. Mm -hmm. We used to go there as young, younger, teenagers, before we could bar. go to the bar. Uh-uh. Before we go to the bar, they had a jukebox. They used to have these rainbow jukebox, and you could get food, and you could listen to the music. You know who owned it? I'm trying to remember who owned the Busy Bee. I asked my sister, can she remember? Yeah. But that was a place where we as teenagers, because we couldn't go into the bar until you were 18. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but now Mr. Cook owned Bar Harbor. Okay. Two brothers, Walter Cook and, uh, what was his brother's name? I can't think of it now. But I can tell you... Uh, you know where they were from in the South? They were from Virginia. Okay. Yeah. They were from Virginia. Do you and have any relatives still alive? I was about to tell you. 
uh, Walter is still alive, and he has a, uh, there's some folks I could connect you with, yeah. Walter I believe, is an administrator at Harlem Hospital. Okay. That was her father. Okay. She was named for Walter Cook. Uh, his ex-wife uh, and other daughter, I believe they, one lives in Maple House, I think the other lives in Soton House. But we could find out, you know. What about Take Six? What kind of place is that? Which one? Take Six. I mean, Club Six. You mean Club Six? Yeah. Uh, Club Six and Tarrytown. I didn't go there that much. But that was that was under the bridge. Yeah. I didn't go there that much. Uh, actually, I didn't go that much to Club, believe it not, in Tarrytown, period. It was an accident how I met your father there. Don't go there. Under. I'm not. But Wonder Bar, what do you remember about that place? Good food. All right. food. See, they always had, probably somebody can tell you, somebody who had a good rep thing that could throw down. And that was always in appendance to these places. Same way like in Peekskill. There used to be a place up there we used to go, the best food. What was it called? I can't even think of it. i got to find somebody, you know, who remembers. That place closed, too. Didn't survive, you know. But what what you will find in Westchester, there were two places in White Plains where I can remember, and Chris Boswell could tell you, Weeks's, and then there was another one, Talks, that's what it was. Talks? Yeah, it was called Talks. What was it spelled? I think T-A-R-K-S. Okay. I think that's what it was. Um, I could almost see it. They had good food, see? Barter. Yeah. And the main, like I said, when somebody said, let's go out, it wasn't, it wasn't so much for drinking, it was for eating. Because you have to remember, we weren't as welcome in, in restaurants in those days. Did segregation basically kill those places? I mean, the end of segregation, integration? I think in some ways it might have, and then, then poor uh, business. But I think... Well, they I didn't th have poor business before, they're doing well, but... It managed, yeah, but when you don't have a choice, okay. you see, that's the difference. When you don't have a choice. But, I mean, for years, that, that was the only places that we had to go. Wherein, when you start having options, you also tend to move up what, what you will accept when you have options. Now, can, go I ahead. about the places in the city, like Wells and places. Okay, now, Wells, we used to go, oh, man. People well, I think would get on the trains all the way down the city. They would because, you, let's say you went to the Apollo. Okay. Or you went to, you remember there was... Um, was the Odeon? I don't know. You know. No, I don't know about Odeon, but I can tell you one place where. See, I went to Boy. where a downstairs, or the Savoy was for dancing. Okay. okay you got to remember, it's two different age groups, too. Um, uh, small, small mm -hmm. paradise. Mm -hmm. That was right downstairs. Upstairs was Apex, where I went to beauty school. Uh -huh. So when you got, when you start hitting 20, 21, that, that, you could go. To uh, Smalls had entertainment, okay. see, and so entertainment always was complemented by food. The smalls served food. Oh yeah, they served food, and they also had entertainment. It was no. Uh, uh, there was Sugar Ray Robinson place. Who he had Wells. Did they have Wells? What about the no? Wells was only known for the best fried chicken and waffles. Didn't have entertainment. No, no entertainment. But what it was, it was a place on Sunday. Folks go after church, you know. Sort of like in Washington, they have a place like that. Also, uh, when people had been out like dancing or entertainment, then they go there. It was an after. If you left the Apollo and you're hungry, you could go to Wells. And they were known for that. There's another place uh, that had wonderful food and also entertainment. What was the name? All right, there's Baby Grand. They had good food. Jocko's? No. Remember Jocko's? No, I don't remember Jocko. I remember Red Rooster. Red Rooster had delicious food. That's not far from the Apollo? Well, no, Red Rooster was up on uh, 7th Avenue. 130, between 130 Very similar to Club 40. 6? Uh, no, better, better move another level. See, New York places were a little more sophisticated than out here. Is it just as southern as every place else? They were southern, but it depends on the cook. Sometimes they were Caribbean cooks. Uh, there was a place we used to go to the best spare ribs. Oh, man, there were two spare places known in Harlem. Do you remember there was one place that was called... What they called? Uh, it was Bogus or Bagus Barbecue. Remember, it was like an Asian name in one place. I don't know the other one. 
Mm, I'll tell you two good ones that uh, people could tell you. Uh, what was the name? Oh, man. Was Sherman's. 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 Yes, anybody in Harlem, old, especially anybody, even with Ethel, yeah. yeah. And then there was another one up on uh, Sugar Hill. Mm -hmm. And that place they renovated and whatnot. I can't think of it. They had good ribs. You ever been to the chicken shack before it closed down? I don't know if it's still it's still there. You ever heard of it? I think I yeah. I think that was uh I think that was up near not too far from Red Roots, I believe. The chicken shack. Yeah. Hmm. Uh there's also a, a wonderful place that we used to go to. Wasn't it was on Eighth Avenue, not around the corner, not too far from where uh, Apex was. We used to go get the best fish. Fried fish for a dollar sandwich. Can't think of the name of it, but I mean the pe the guys from the precinct would go. Everybody knew you get the best fish sandwiches. Uh, what about on uh, Coney Island? Because I know you worked there. Wasn't there some places out there? Atlantic. City? Not worked Atlantic City. Yeah. yeah. Some, now Atlantic City, we had um, baby. It wasn't Baby Grand. What was it called? Oh my goodness, that's where I met. Uh, I tell you, um, Sarah Vaughn. That was that place was called Weeks's. Weeks. Weeks's. They had good. Uh, they, the other place. And why? And they, there was a. Was there? A always menu? food. Did they played music or something nearby. Yeah. What was the Entertainment, menu? and and then menu. Was it? Uh, oh, they serve. Uh, in other words, you all. Yeah, food. you always had that combination in in most of those things. Now there was another fish place called the Fishery, in Atlantic City. People come from, they come off that boardwalk, go to fish. Because, again, back in those days, we couldn't always go in restaurants on the boardwalk. So black people knew to come off. The hotel where I worked at in restaurant was called the Liberty Hotel. And the restaurant was downstairs. We serviced, again, because black people knew once you cross Atlantic Avenue, between Atlantic and Pacific, we could be served. Yeah, there was no signs up. It was just customary and said to certain places you couldn't go in. That's right. People knew. They knew where to go. What would happen is people would ask, where can I eat? Black people would ask each other, where can I get a good place to eat? They knew. They knew. And I can't tell you that they uh Now, when I went south, I saw signs. Mm -hmm. Okay? My first introduction uh, to the Mason Dixon line was in Norfolk, Virginia. How did you eat when I was sent to the, the back when You know, we were known to carry the shoebox. You know, you heard that on MK? Mm -hmm. Okay. What it was, the shoebox was cooked with fried chicken. And your whole lunch, and when you ate that, then if you had to eat, like with me, I ate my shoebox, my mama fixed by the time I get to Delaware from uh, Pennsylvania Station. When I got off the Cape Town Ferry, and I got to take a trailway bus, I go up to the thing, and you got to go to the back. You couldn't go inside. So I, that's my introduction to well, segregation. You could buy a sandwich, or what could you buy? You could get a sandwich or something, but... First of all, people were so nasty, you you didn't even hardly trust eating their food. So most of the time, you know, you might get a hot dog or hamburger, but you're not going to go there for a meal. Uh, you wait until you get to where your destination was. That's why they always had food waiting for you when you get there. Uh, there were a lot of signs down there, No, you know, no black people. They were bold about it. Sometimes they tell me in Arkansas they even put no in our GDR. And I, they probably had it in South Carolina. By the time I got to South Carolina, things had changed. But Nora would be the one to tell you. Yeah, definitely you need to interview Nora.